Hi, my name is Richard Savell. I'm the director of the Surgical Intensive Care Unit here at Maimonides Medical Center. This is our educational video focusing in on the critically ill neuro patient. I'd like to begin with a disclaimer that these are my opinions and they're not the opinions of Maimonides Medical Center or the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and they are not meant to be construed as medical advice. These are educational videos for our trainees in the surgical intensive care unit. Our focus in this video will be on the following topics. I'm going to spend a few moments speaking about how you should be focusing in on a patient who presents with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. We'll talk for a very few minutes about a patient with a subdural hematoma. We'll then take some time to share with you what you should be thinking about when you are dealing with a patient with elevated intracranial pressure. And then finally, a few moments talking about stroke. Patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage can be very gratifying to manage because there's a lot of complexity involved. But if you stay focused and work closely with your supervising intensivist, as well as your neurosurgeon and your interventional neuroradiologist, there really is a right way to help optimize the outcomes in patients who present with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we'll go over that now. So first things first. For all of these entities, my team and I think it's important for you to understand why is the patient in the intensive care unit in the first place. And that can often really help you. You're looking for a change in their neuro status, which might require them to perhaps have their airway secured, or perhaps require them to have another imaging study performed, or potentially rapidly require the proceduralist to either perform some form of decompressive craniectomy or perhaps an urgent placement of an EVD or a ventriculostomy. So please keep that in mind that that's why they're there in the ICU and they're at high risk, especially when they first come into the intensive care unit, to have significant change in their clinical status. And it's important that you quickly pick that up and make sure that that primary team, neurosurgery and interventional neuroradiology, is notified to make sure of these clinical changes. The next step is to know that a patient presenting with an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage can rapidly initially present with decreased mental status, not because of the fact that the aneurysm may have ruptured and caused subarachnoid hemorrhage, but that the patient is developing acute hydrocephalus and maybe developing a herniation syndrome from that. That's why these patients, as you'll see when you rotate with us, will often have an EVD, an external ventricular drain, placed before they even come into the intensive care unit. This is placed in our institution by the neurosurgery team. The patients, when the aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs, can develop a form of communicating obstructive hydrocephalus because of clotting and clogging of the arachnoid granulation. When a patient has an EVD, from your perspective as a trainee in the intensive care unit, when you present the patient on rounds and when you're helping to manage the patient, there are some important variables that you need to be aware of and to present. The first is whether or not the ventriculostomy is in place or not. Does a patient have it at all? If they have it, is it set at either, either being opened or clamped? And we'll talk about this later. If it's open, it's open at a certain number of centimeters of water above the ear, and it's extraordinarily important that you, the nursing staff, and the primary neurosurgical and interventional neuroradiology team are all 100% on the same page as to how they want that set. I can't emphasize that enough as how important that can be. If it's opened and set at a certain number of centimeters of water above the ear, that's an indication of how much the pressure can rise before the CSF spills out. And so when one of these is in place and is being weaned, it's weaned in two ways. As the patient improves clinically, the primary team will come by and either do clamping trials, which is the more routine way, where the EVD is closed, and it's again incredibly important that you as the trainee in the SICU are aware of when it is opened or closed because when it's closed the patients can develop changes in their 
uh, mental status or their neurological examination that could mandate immediately contacting the primary team for them to reassess the patient and to work with you to see if the ventriculostomy needs to be opened. If the patient continues to fail their clamping trials, many times these patients will end up requiring a VP shunt. It's also important that you know that the ventriculostomy acts therapeutically but also allows us to determine what the intracranial pressures are. Those are in millimeters of mercury and those can become elevated above 15. That's when we start to develop a sense of unease and concern. And again, that would be when you would start to coordinate again with your intensivist supervising as well as the primary team. The other focus of a patient like this is what are their blood pressure targets? And so what will normally happen is a patient will come in, they will have had either a CT angiogram or a formal cerebral angiogram, be evaluated by the neurosurgery team and or the interventional neuroradiology team for determination of how to control the aneurysm. That won't be up to you. If the aneurysm hasn't been controlled, and it's often the case that when they first come in overnight, it may be an uncontrolled aneurysm, meaning that there hasn't been an intervention performed yet, this is important for you to have a complete control over what the blood pressure targets are and that you make sure we've met them. Because working in the ICU, we have the medications to get the blood pressure wherever we want it. Usually when they first come in, these patients will have a lower targeted blood pressure. Once the aneurysm has been controlled and the proceduralist is satisfied with the result, we will often let the blood pressure ride and let the blood pressure go up as high as it would go up naturally. We will often not particularly give medicines to make the blood pressure artificially high, at least early on. There are things that we as critical care team members are concerned about for patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage and I'd like to talk about those issues now. The first is vasospasm, which can cause delayed cerebral ischemia, and this can present usually days 6 to 14, although you may read different days, but those are sort of the uh, classic days where you start to be concerned about delayed cerebral ischemia from vasospasm. And the issues are we have certain medications like nimodipine that are given routinely to try and prevent this, and if we see a patient is developing it, we try to treat it with, uh, again, there's not a particularly large evidence base behind it, but it is a consensus that we use what's called triple H therapy, hypertensive hypervolemic hemodilution for these patients. And the, particular, the particulars of how that is implemented vary from institution to institution, but in general, where I am here at the medical center, we tend to use norepinephrine and target a particular systolic blood pressure, this is coordinated on an individual patient-by-patient -patient basis where we coordinate closely with the interventional neuroradiology team as well as the neurosurgery team. In addition, these patients may require significant fluid. They may also receive albumin to keep the central venous pressure greater than a certain arbitrary number, sometimes eight. And our focus here is it's also known as hemodynamic augmentation and that in previous years, there would be more of a focus of placing a pulmonary artery catheter and actually starting inotropes in particular for patients like this. But in general now, the focus is to titrate a certain uh, means, uh, either mean arterial pressure or systolic blood pressure or cerebral perfusion pressure, which is MAP minus ICP. And again, this is determined on a case-by-case -case basis and may change over time. These can be very dynamic situations. Other issues are in terms of placing patients on prophylactic seizure medications. This is an interesting controversy in the patient with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. In general, there's a tendency to use less phenytoin and more Keppra than we uh, used to. And again, we try to keep it short, three to five days if there's been no actual evidence of seizure activity in the patient. But again, this is individualized and it's important for you to coordinate closely with your intensivist as well as the supervising neuro team. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about electrolyte abnormalities in these patients. They can develop hyponatremia, and if you start reading a lot about this, there's lots of discussion about whether or not it's primarily cerebral salt wasting versus the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH, and the consensus is that this is really more of an SIADH picture rather than cerebral salt wasting.
In general, although the standard therapy for SIADH tends to be fluid restriction, that's not what's used routinely in these patients, and there's a real standard focus on using 3% hypertonic saline, um, usually through a central line, although this is being reevaluated, and usually it starts out in the range of 50 milliliters per hour. Um, and again, hypernatremia in general is okay in these patients. Hyponatremia is not. Um, and again, it's very important for you as the trainee to remember your focus when you're managing these patients is to remember why are they there. They're there for frequent neurologic monitoring. They're there for intracranial pressure monitoring. And if there's a change in either the ICP or in their neurostatus, that you rapidly gather up the troops, that you get everybody involved to make sure that you think whether or not the patient's airway needs to be secured, whether or not imaging studies need to be performed, or whether or not this patient needs another procedure. I'd like to end this section by talking about an interesting area. These patients can develop a form of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, uh, the transient left ventricular apical ballooning syndrome in these patients that is felt to be related to the high catechols of the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage itself. This can be very profound and can present as formal cardiogenic shock in these patients, and they can require high doses of inotropes and uh, pressors, so combinations of norepinephrine and uh, dobutamine. And this does resolve as the patient gets through their support uh, with the kind of uh, support that I just described. And it's very important to remember that these patients, all these neuropatients are at high risk for having aspirated before you've even met them, that we're constantly thinking about fever in these patients and doing our best to mitigate it and to quickly make sure whether or not we believe that this fever is central fever or does this patient have an evidence of an infection. So this concludes the section on aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. In this next section of the video, we'd like to focus in on a few helpful hints on patients with subdural hematoma, some basic points about intracranial pressure management, and a few comments about stroke. Patients who you will be seeing who have developed a subdural hematoma, your question should be, is this acute or chronic? If it's acute, it's going to be white on CT, non-contrast, and if it's chronic in general, it will be dark. Patients can actually have acute on chronic. Some of these patients won't even have had a procedure and may not get a procedure. They're being admitted to the ICU. Again, common theme, blood pressure control and frequent neuro checks. It's your job when these patients come into the unit to look at them closely when they first come into the unit to get a baseline neurologic examination and then while you're on call to frequently reassess their neuro exam because if it changes, you need to start contacting people. You need to make sure that the primary neurosurgery team is aware and the intensivist team is aware. What happens to these patients is if there's a worsening of the subdural hematoma, in general, your decision after you've notified the primary team is to see if you think the patient immediately needs to have their airway secured, and then you go through the standard protocol for that in our unit. And then these patients sometimes will either get another imaging study or if they're deteriorating very quickly, we'll go right to the operating room. Again, your focus is over and over again to find out exactly what blood pressure targets your intensivist and neurosurgeon want. In general, the patients with subdural hematomas are normotensive initially because if they've had long-standing uncontrolled or poorly controlled high blood pressure, bringing the blood pressure down too much can be dangerous as well. When the patients come out, if they've had a procedure, whether they've had a formal uh, craniotomy or a burr hole performed, your job is to find out from the primary team if they have a drain, what the drain settings are, and whether the drain, what the drain actually is. Is it a subgaleal drain or a subdural drain, or perhaps both? That's really the focus for patients with subdural hematoma. In general, patients with subdural hematoma tend to be a very gratifying group to manage as they can do extremely well in general after their procedures performed if they require one. We want to take a few moments to talk about how you should understand the concept of managing elevated intracranial pressures in the intensive care unit. 
This would be seen in a patient who perhaps has had a large hemispheric stroke and is starting to develop signs and symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure. In a trauma unit, patients with traumatic brain injury frequently have issues where their primary uh, problems are those of elevated intracranial pressure. In general, from your perspective, if a patient has an EVD in place or some other way to have the intracranial pressures measured and they're starting to go up and the patient is having concomitant changes in their neurostatus, you will be working and will be supervised by your intensivist as well as the neurosurgery team, but what you'll be doing is treating the patient with hyperosmolar therapy. In general, in our unit, that is either mannitol or hypertonic saline. We will be giving you on a case-by-case -case basis the particular targets, either a combination of the serum osmolarity or the serum sodium, and there's no evidence that one is better than the other. If hypertonic saline is used, in general, in this unit, we use continuous infusions of 3% saline. In general, at about 50 milliliters per hour is where we start and then titrate up and down. We do have the ability at the critical care attending level to give 23.4% saline, and those are given in 30 milliliter pushes, but that has to be done by the ICU attending. And the concept here is you're trying to shrink the brain. You're decreasing the size of the fluid component in the brain to try and decrease intracranial pressures. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up what you're looking for if somebody is having changes in neuro exam. You'll start to see a new focal neuro exam, a new focal extremity being weak. Perhaps they'll be developing facial weakness. Or you may start to see the Cushing's response, elevated blood pressure, and bradycardia. In this unit, you don't wait for things to become obvious. If there are any subtle changes in the neuro exam, the primary team must be aware. Our comments about stroke are general ones. It's obviously an entire field of specialty. In our hospital, if you're rotating with us in the surgical ICU, in general, it's either an ischemic stroke that is so uh, concerning from their neuro exam that there may be herniation, that if they're brought to you, your focus has to be, what's my blood pressure target and what's my baseline neuro exam? Patients with intracranial hemorrhage in general come to our unit, and again, it's the same focus. Are they intubated already? And if so, these patients, we try to use as little sedation as possible, but if there is agitation, it's in general one of the patients where we may be using propofol by itself because it's so absolutely crucial that we have a sense of what their neuro exam is. These patients are all at high risk, as we've mentioned previously, for aspiration and have a low threshold to work with your ICU supervising attending to start antibiotics if you feel there may already be a pneumonia. And it's very important that if a patient has had some form of a hemispheric MCA infarct, they're often brought to our intensive care unit under the collaborative approach of both the stroke neurologist and the neurosurgeon to see if the patient meets criteria for a decompressive hemicraniectomy. And it's obviously beyond the scope of this video to go into those details, but in general, that's what you're watching for. So this concludes our video on your perspective as a trainee in the surgical ICU here on how to think about patients who have neuro ICU problems. As I've said numerous times, I'm very proud to help care for these patients. We work collaboratively with our neurosurgeons, with our interventional neuroradiologists, with our stroke neurologist, as well as our usual multidisciplinary critical care team to help optimize these outcomes in these patients. They can often be young and incredibly salvageable. So our focus from your perspective is to stay focused on the basics, to stay focused on doing a good neuro exam, to stay focused on making sure of what your blood pressure targets are and that you keep them there, and that if there's changes in clinical status, to make sure every member of the team is aware so that appropriate, timely interventions, interventions can be performed. Thanks again.